Firefly is um, the source of probably more joy and pain than anything I've done. It was, to me, um, a new kind of storytelling. It's this wonderful combination of a future and, 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 and a past. It basically tells us, you know, this is us in the future. Our, our problems are the same. We're just more of us spread over more planets. It was about nine people looking into the blackness of space and seeing nine different things. That, to me, is what's interesting. Action! When you have a Joss Whedon on, on your payroll, as the studio did, you know, obviously they were looking to try and get another project out of him. And so he, at one of the early meetings, said to them, well, I've got this idea that I've always played with of doing some, this sort of show. And they just were eager to get a show from him. So they said, oh, yes, great, 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 let's do it. So I wanted to get a show that took the past and the future and put them together by making them feel like the present, by making... Uh, a show with not only troubles that people could relate to as opposed to aliens or bumpy foreheads or ambassadors or things that you know are not part of everyday life but like getting a job getting out of trouble um, you know stuff like that that was very simple put it all in the present and give it a sort of you are here feel I got to read the various uh, incarnations of the script and boy I thought that looked neat uh, it was a western, but it was in space, and there were horses, and there were guns, and there were cool people on a spaceship. When I delivered Serenity, the two-hour pilot, the network um, kind of got cold feet about it. Um, they felt, uh, you know, they didn't want uh, a long sort of story that took its time explaining who everybody was. They wanted to jump in the middle of the action. That was kind of the Fox dictum was... You're in the thick of it, let's go. The initial results, they, they made, made the network nervous, um, that the men, the men didn't respond as strongly as they thought they would and that the women responded more strongly. They wanted a little more humor injected, and particularly in the character of the captain. The idea originally was that he was very closed off and over the course of the pilot, we found out why. And then over the course of the series, we saw him, you know, we saw he was a decent man and we got to see him warm up. And they said, wow, we, we only have a certain amount of time to hook the viewers in to a new property. We need to do it more quickly. They wanted to get in with some action, get in with some jokes, and come in right in the middle of an adventure. But I had nine characters with, you know, very involved stories and a world nobody had seen before that was culled from all different cultures. So there was just a huge amount of visual and oral and character information for people to absorb in an hour. Rather than not making the show, we of course tried to work with them on that score. Tim and Joss were very eager to certainly please our partners because they're financing the show. They told us they needed to see sort of what the first couple episodes would look like. You know, what, what does this look like as a TV series? I mean, we've seen this pilot, we're still not quite sure what it would be week to week. So in order to convince them to pick up the show, uh, we came up with the story for, for the train job. And they thought that seemed okay, uh, but really what they wanted to see was a script. And they wanted to see it by Monday. So we had two days to write what was, in essence, going to be a new pilot. We scrambled to make the train job and explain everything in the second episode, which was then the pilot. And we still wanted them to air Serenity first, because we felt no matter what, uh, this was such a complex, new universe with so many characters that really you needed that Western two-hour um, introduction to this world to really understand it. Uh, sadly, uh, the network did not agree, and they aired it later. A lot of the pressure of being a show that might be canceled at any moment um, really helps you. Uh, it doesn't help your digestion. It doesn't help your marriage, but what it does help is um, your storytelling because and you go back and you say, what is the most important thing I need to feel? What is the most primal story? What is the thing that is going to show how great this crew is? You know, how um, you know, funny they are, how brave, how disjoint, whatever it is you need. What do I need? Get primal. They would break a story and, you know, come run to the set and be like, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And it was just like, it was just these incredible 
you know, Joss and Tim, sort of their minds were just, you know, always going and going and going, and, and then we'd get the scripts, and it was just, I mean, they were like gold. We wouldn't get the first drafts. We'd only get the shooting draft, which is good. It protected us from whining, I guess, and saying, I like that other line. It was nice. I wanted to say that in Chinese. Joss had a really specific vision in his head of, of sort of what happened between now and when Firefly is set, and the notion that sort of the only two superpowers that survived were the United States and China. The idea was, your most basic white trash person can speak Chinese. You're the person, you know, with no education, who, you know, was the last person you'd expect speaks Chinese off the bat. And um, it just gives it a lovely kind of lived-in texture. As far as the Chinese goes, I resented it. They just randomly come into my head like, Wang Yi, Yijidish. It wasn't easy at all. Chinese is not exactly you know, I mean, French is easier than Chinese. If it was French, it would be fine, but it was a little difficult, yeah. I like to think we educated the world by teaching them a little bit of Mandarin. The writers would be in their room, in their writing room, and they'd come up with really funny things to say if you knew what you were saying in English. We only did phrases that we didn't need to know what they meant. Like, if he shout, this way, we know he's saying, shut up. And if he goes, blah, 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 we know he's going, oh my god, I'm very surprised. He wouldn't put one word expletives that you then switch to Chinese, like, man, and, you know, wuz, and then explain, it was these long, wu di ma, hu ta, de, hu fong, huang, de, wai, shun, and I don't speak Chinese, and I have even trouble ordering at Chinese restaurants. Every episode, I was making several phone calls to a group of people, and it was always a back and forth. Um, trying to get the right words. I did love the fact that you didn't have to bleep anything out and you could actually say, you know, frog humping, cat sucking, piss ant in Chinese and not have to worry about the censors going, oh, you can't say shit. For other things, more current slang, um, like baboon's ass crack per se, <laughs> I would call my friends um, who was more up on the uh, current colloquialisms and, and curse words in China or Taiwan. We had cassette tapes that we were to listen to to get the sound of it right, and most of the time none of us got the sound of it right anyway. I would sort of hear what it was supposed to sound like, and then I'd hear the actor say it. <laughs> and I bet there are a lot of people in China going, what the hell are they saying? <laughs> We wanted a, a, a multi-racial sort of mix of people because our, our statement was in the future, you know, there's two superpowers and everybody's mixed. That's why the way people dress are, are mixed and he wanted to, to have that reflected in these people coming together. My very original concept was a little smaller. Uh, I had like five characters. And then when I sort of said, okay, Millennium Falcon, yes, stagecoach, better, um, I realized, you know, I'm going to be living on this boat. And, and, and a lesson I learned from Angel is you really need an ensemble, and especially because I thought of this as more of a drama than an action drama when I first conceived it. When I actually got down to making it, I decided to go from five to nine. When each one of those characters plays ultimately a very important role in the show, it, you know, it really was incumbent up upon Joss and, and the casting team to, to find some great actors, and I, and I think we did. What I said to Joss in our first meeting was, I'm so not this guy. He's tortured, he's bitter, he's hollow, he's, he has no hope, he's, he's, there's nothing you know, lively and wonderful exploding within this man. I kept telling him, I'm not this guy, I'm, I'm really not this tortured soul. Ultimately, eight of the nine original cast members stuck, uh, the one that didn't being Rebecca Gayhart, who was the last role cast, the part of Inara. Ultimately, it didn't, it didn't work out for, for either one of us, um, and that led us to discover Morena. I go in and audition, and uh, basically just uh, stick around for a couple hours, meet Joss, hang out, find out I'm testing the next day, and then like start work the day after that. It was so fast, and it was mind-blowing. I remember going down from my network test into uh, the set where everybody was shooting and being like, great, this is where you're working now. <laughs> I was a big fan of Westerns growing up, and Warren Oates and Eli Wallach were two um, 
really kind of down and dirty characters, one from The Wild Bunch, one from The Good, Bad, and The Ugly, and I just thought, boy, it'd be great to play a guy like that, but handsomer. Everything was a first for me. I'd never, I'd never gone to a table read with all the other actors and all these people that I'd seen on TV before, and I went and uh, sat with all the other, uh, other actors and did the first read through of the script, and it came to life, and I was shaking with excitement. It was just, every moment was incredible. I have kept myself from being exposed to as much science fiction as possible. <laughs> so I was actually delighted that, um, that um, there were no um, prosthetics. The script came in, I heard Joss Whedon was behind it, got excited, read it, got even more excited, and um, heard that if I were to get the part, I would have to gain 20 pounds. He wanted Kaylee to look like a woman. He didn't want any sort of anorexic looking, you know, young actress uh, type girl that everybody's so used to seeing on TV. He wanted somebody that looked like they enjoyed a cheeseburger once in a while and uh, really embellished in life. You never have to be under the heel of nobody ever again. No matter how long the arm of the Alliance might get, we'll just get ourselves a little further. Malcolm Reynolds represented someone who, although had lost all his hope, would not give up, just would press on. He didn't have any grand dreams. He didn't have any grand causes or goals. All he wanted to do was continue. He wasn't gonna shut down and die. He was just gonna continue living his life. Do you want me to put it up? No, that's okay. I think Inara brought to that world, to the, the life of, of these people on the ship, uh, the heart and sort of like a nurturing quality. I think that she um, is an extremely passionate person and she cared very, very much for every single person on that ship. Shouldn't be a problem at all. My strongest understanding of Wash came through my relationship with Zoe, or Gina, with my wife. That was where I had the most understanding. I think it was an interesting relationship. She was this solid fighter woman, and I was a chicken. I didn't, I didn't like fighting. I wasn't in the war. I wore Hawaiian shirts all the time. I just, I loved Gina, and we had a great rapport, and the stuff that was written for us, this kind of struggle, the struggling marriage, uh, made sense to me. Captain shouldn't be babysitting a damn groupie, and he knows it. Okay, when did this become not funny? When you didn't turn around and put her ass back down on Triumph. She's the resident, like, hard-ass chick. <laughs> She's the one. She gets the job done. She enjoys her job. She is career military. She has no problem with killing people if it's right. And because she is career military, I mean, you really won't hear her um, argue with or pose Mal too often unless she she really thinks there's something wrong. Where do you think you're going? Zoe's been badly hurt. I need my medical supplies. Simon had a lot technically to do on the show in terms of, you know, wounds and bullet holes and you know, lots of fun filled infirmary bloody stuff. She's the, the wayward child of the group. She understands. She doesn't comprehend. And I think that she's a purpose for them, too. They had to make decisions that they wouldn't normally wake, make on her behalf, you know, having to try to help her, save her. There's no beacon. Which means it's likely no one's looking to find her. All the more reason for us to do the right thing. I think Book is kind of the, the conscience of the ship in any kind of situation, he could be inserted as the conscience, uh, both from his own point of view and also um, from the perspective of being able to require other people to be aware of dealing with where their consciences are coming from. Care to make the first incision, Dr. Tan? <laughs> Happy birthday, sir. Kaylee brings the sense of family. She makes sure that everybody remembers that they really are one big family and all they have is each other. 
Don't know these folks, don't much care to. They're whores. I'm in. Sex, <laughs> muscle, humor, thuggery. Jane. Pretty cunning, don't you think? When you look at the pilot that Joss created, it's not what you expect in what might be thought of as a space opera. Everything's handheld, virtually everything's handheld. There are zooms, like in a 70s Western, there are actually zooms in a shot. And nowadays, people don't use zooms so much as sort of dolly moves or, I mean, zooms are considered to be somewhat cheesy. And uh, that cheese aspect actually really added, I think, to the look of the show. If, if you got a flare, if you bumped into something sometimes, if you misframed, they almost liked it better. And a lot of times it was, don't hold a perfect frame. Be, be a little bit off, make it a little different. All of a sudden you find something that wasn't, you weren't expecting and continue shooting. And that includes the CGI shots we did and everything, just sort of haphazard and embracing the zoom lens and, and not covering things in a normal television fashion. Um, all designed to, uh, to sort of give you that feeling of, well, this is just something that's happening and you're there in the thick of it, as opposed to science fiction which says, stand back for this is a forbidden planet. You know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to be stately at all. I really just wanted to have that immediacy. We got very excited because we wanted to bring that into the photography of, you know, live action spaceships. You know, we wanted to have handheld camera, whip pans, lens flares, rack focuses, and zooms, all of which have been complete taboos in visual effects. They're things that you don't do because you can't repair them. You know, we as a group said, okay, there's gonna, there's certain risks that we're gonna be taking here, and some, some techniques are gonna work, some are not, you know, and whatever happens, happens, and we're just gonna have to compensate and make it work. But we've never seen, you know, sort of camera operators that are late in catching the action on a computer-generated ship. We've never seen, you know, a camera operator mounted to the side of a spaceship that, you know, you know that vibrates, you know, to the uh, extent that you can barely see what it's seeing. I have friends that still sing the theme song. I the theme song just gets in your gets under your skin, and I I love it. That that song, every word in it is very deliberate, and uh, is it tells the story of exactly who Mal is from the get go. We had Greg Edmondson on it on the show, and and um, he got more than anybody, uh, and it's a hard thing to get the idea of using a kind of Western vernacular and then mixing it with world music, and you know a Chinese influence as well, and. Um, uh, and at the same time servicing a normal TV score so that, you know, the, here's the sad moment, here's the happy moment, without being intrusive. And there are things he did for that show that went way beyond just telling the story or expressing the mood of a certain scene. He went way beyond that. He was really telling a story, too. And he expressed things in Firefly that couldn't have been expressed any other way. And there was always emotion there, even in the goofy stuff, and there were many funny, funny moments and there were many poignant moments, and there were many just dark moments, but I always tried to write from the emotion rather than from the character. That man more than once brought tears to my eyes. I would watch an episode to enjoy it and to really just watch it and have a good time, and then I'd go back immediately and I'd watch it again just for the music, just for particular scenes where the music really, really touched me. We used instruments you never, ever use because I, th I believe Joss, Joss saw this, as a post-apocalyptic world where cultures were thrown together in this giant melting pot, therefore anything that you could use somehow was justified. Chinese music could be mixed in with, uh, you know, uh, Eastern European music mixed in with orchestral music. And I remember he called me for uh, the last piece of score on the message. There's a scene at the end. I had people who say, I've been in this business for 15 years, I've never had this much fun. Like really cynical people um, saying, you know, this is, you know, feeling like they were part of something bigger. I would come and sit on set before my scenes would come up. I just couldn't, I couldn't stand to sit in my trailer. I'd think, oh, they're, you know, they're inside having fun without me. I've got to, you know, go be in the middle of it. It was a very sarcastic set. 
um, you know, if somebody was correcting you to say, um, don't turn so far into the camera on the shot because you're getting into the light of this other actor, they might say it in a way where they go, listen, fool, when you're turning, you're ruining everything behind you. Is this going to be a selfish moment for you, or do you want to help the team? You know, they, we were having fun. Everybody had a good time. I always think of Ariel, the moment when uh, Mal grabs Kaylee from behind and just kind of hugs her, which is just something Nathan did on the set. Nobody said it wasn't in the script, it wasn't the director. It was just something Nathan just kind of naturally did. It seemed like the thing to do. And that was because, you know, they got along so well and they joked so much. And that love that the cast and the crew were actually feeling for each other and for the work and for what we were doing shows up on screen. Y'all gonna be here when I wake up? We'll be here. Good. We bonded like, like a family. And when it was over, it, it was so difficult to know that you weren't going to be with these people again. You know what, this makes me weepy. <laughs> because it's, it, it was really extraordinary. Really extraordinary, and I do miss it. The cross section of an intelligence of people who are fans of Firefly have just uh, really broadened my my horizons. Uh, I hate to give them that much credit, but it's true. The people who are seeing this understand it, and you know, there's nothing more important. Um, there's only one reason to make art, and that's it. They really kept us going for a long time, and. Um... The fact that there are people still out there who are having firefly parties and stuff, I mean, that's so amazing. That's so humbling to think about. And um, we were really very, very appreciative of it. It's flattering and it's humbling. And uh, it should happen to me more often. <laughs> what the fan reaction did was um, really keep us on our feet. Uh, when, you know, I mean, it was a very difficult year. Obviously, you know, this is not a complete season of television we're talking about. Uh, and that means the C word, as in cancel. And the fan base understood that very early on that we were, we were in trouble um, and needed their help. They got together, they wrote letters, they were very passionate about saving the show and watching the show. They sent postcards to Fox. They sent postcards to the sponsors. They took out a full page ad thanking Fox and thanking uh, the advertisers for supporting Firefly and did it in a, an incredibly organized fashion. I mean, they raised thousands of dollars for that. They also have raised thousands of dollars for several charities um, in the name of Firefly. To know that the fans were becoming as obsessive about the show as we were that quickly um, was really just gratifying and, and uh, you, you know, it's easy to discount something like that, but in our situation it wasn't because, you know, if we had gone on the boards and found, you know, a sort of lackluster response or even just, well, oh, that's very nice, at some point we would have given up. We would have stopped fighting. One of the things that made working with Joss Whedon on any of his shows so fascinating was that he would take an unexpected turn. You would think you would know where the show was coming and he'd come in and say, you know what, we're gonna go over here. And I know he would have done that on Firefly and it would have ended up in places that none of us, including him, could have anticipated. Simon would have finally kissed Kaylee, I think. Uh, long time coming. Joss's plan for if the show had continued involved a lot more sort of uncovering of the, the Blue Sun Corporation, which are the people who are sort of the big, the big corporate entity slash government presence in this future world. And they're the ones that um, were sort of engineering this psychic program that River was abducted into. What would have happened with Mal and Anora? I mean, who knew? Could they ever have gotten together? The answers to all of Adam's questions <laughs> about books past would have been very fun and interesting to uncover. The marriage of, of Wash and Zoe would probably have like maybe gotten into trouble, maybe gotten out of trouble. Something I was really looking forward to seeing was what role River played in this far grander scheme that brought all of this trouble 
to this little crew just trying to do their own thing. To see what world they would have ended up in, um, I think that they would have eventually figured out that where they were on that ship together was as good as any home. The sort of shows that, that, that shine briefly, <laughs> you know, the shows that have a very short run, but that everybody kind of goes, oh, that was something special. That was Firefly. The show didn't go far enough for me to tell uh, the secrets that were contained within, um, but that's something I still hope to do at a later date um, in another venue, so um, I feel like whatever I didn't get to accomplish, uh, I will in terms of narrative. In terms of what I wanted the show to be, I felt like we accomplished it from the first frame. I look forward to the day and time that recollections of my Firefly experience um, doesn't make me cry. <laughs> I really look forward to that day. <laughs> there was something that Adam Baldwin actually said uh, on the last day when we were wrapping everything out. And uh, he said, look, I've been doing this for a while, and the thing that I really appreciate about this particular job is that we all seem to understand how good it is, and we're all appreciating it today as opposed to later. And, um, and that, that was really true. People got it while it was happening. Firefly will forever represent for me, I think, uh just the best of all worlds as far as uh, being a, a pleasant place to work, enjoying the stories I was telling, enjoying the dialogue, enjoying the character and the cast and the crew. I had a very positive experience on Firefly and forever for me it will be the best job I've ever had. The best job I've ever had. My fantasy about this is that um, they'll make a feature and it'll be successful and then someone will come to Joss and say, why don't we make a television series out of Firefly? We made something that I consider extraordinary um, and that I am as proud of as anything I've done. It really was a jewel, just something that uh, when I think back on it, it shines. I can't think of anything else to say besides that.